Kevin H. O'Rourke, A Short History of Brexit, From Brentry to Backstop, Pelican Books. Dive into the complex history of Brexit with this summary of Kevin H. O'Rourke's A Short History of Brexit, From Brentry to Backstop. Discover the deep-rooted ambivalence towards European integration, the role of the British Empire and Commonwealth trade, and the political forces at play. Gain insights into the different phases of European integration and how the UK's relationship with Europe has evolved over the decades. This book summary sheds light on the origins of Brexit, the reasons behind the Leave vote, and the ongoing challenges of the negotiation process. Roots of Brexit's Ambivalence The United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union in 2016 surprised many, but the country's long-standing ambivalence toward integration within European institutions can be traced back decades. UK's reluctance to join the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC, in 1951 exemplifies this tension, highlighting underlying concerns over losing national sovereignty and control over trade relationships. Understanding this historical context provides crucial insight into Brexit's origins and implications. Brexit, the UK's departure from the European Union, sent shockwaves around the world on June 23, 2016. Many British citizens viewed leaving the EU as a chance for a brighter future or a potential downfall, depending on individual perspectives. However, this momentous decision did not emerge unexpectedly. In fact, the roots of Brexit extend far back into the heart of British history, driven by an ambivalence towards supranational governance and a desire to maintain national sovereignty. Supranational organizations, like the European Union, involve member states pooling sovereignty in institutions such as the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice. While this integration can create tensions within all member states, the UK has historically been more resistant than others. This hesitance dates back to the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community, ECSC, in 1951, an early predecessor to the EU. The ECSC brought together Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Italy, and West Germany to collectively manage their coal and steel production under a centralized authority. Although the UK supported European cooperation, they were apprehensive about joining the ECSC due to its supranational nature. This reluctance stemmed from fears that the community would jeopardize the UK's control over coal and steel imports from the British Empire and compromise the recent nationalization of the coal industry. Ultimately, the UK opted not to join the ECSC, which set two significant precedents, the progression toward closer European integration and the marginalization of British influence within that integration. This early ambivalence toward European integration demonstrates the UK's prevailing anxiety over losing national sovereignty, particularly in regards to trade relationships with their diminishing empire, an essential factor in understanding the origins and impacts of Brexit. Trade Balancing Act The British Empire was undeniably controversial, yet continued to serve as a source of pride for many Britons. As World War II ended and the era of imperialism waned, Britain sought to empower its former colonies by granting them independence and creating the Commonwealth. This group of equal, independent nations shared history and facilitated blossoming trade. However, as the UK aimed to engage with European integration efforts, challenges arose in balancing their commitment to the Commonwealth with European trade aspirations. In the mid-20th century, the UK found itself navigating the delicate relationship between their overseas Commonwealth commitments and the evolving desire to participate in European integration. British and European Coal and Steel Community ECSC, representatives met in 1955 to discuss reducing trade barriers, most notably import tariffs. Britain proposed a free trade zone, in which members would enjoy tariff-free exchanges of goods and services while retaining the ability to negotiate trade agreements with external countries. However, free trade zones can be problematic due to differing trade policies among member nations. Because of variations in tariffs on imported goods from non-member countries, it becomes challenging to accurately tax incoming goods. As an example, 
if Australian beef were duty-free in the UK but faced a 10% tariff in France, French authorities would need to scrutinise British beef imports to determine their origin. Such inspection processes demand time and financial resources. ECSC countries preferred an alternative, a customs union. Unlike free trade zones, customs unions eliminate tariffs among member nations while also imposing identical external tariffs. This eliminates the need for origin verification and decreases border control expenses. British politicians, however, viewed customs unions as incompatible with the preferential treatment they provided to Commonwealth trade. As a result, the UK did not sign the 1957 Treaty of Rome, which formalized the European Economic Community, EEC, and established a customs union among member nations. In trying to balance their loyalty to the Commonwealth with an interest in European trade, the UK faced difficult choices and ultimately opted for a course that left them outside of key European economic developments. Birth of EFTA, a British endeavour after excluding itself from a customs union with key European economies, the UK aimed to regain influence by initiating a free trade zone called the European Free Trade Association EFTA. This organisation suited Britain's industrial economy, favouring cooperation over rigid rules, and focused solely on industrial goods to maintain low tariffs on agricultural imports. Despite initial setbacks due to perceived UK self-interest, the EFTA was established in 1960 with several European nations, creating a second trade bloc alongside the EEC. In an attempt to gain influence and establish better economic ties, the United Kingdom proposed the creation of the European Free Trade Association EFTA, a separate organization more in line with their interests. The UK's industrial economy differed significantly from other European agricultural economies, leading to British politicians advocating for a free trade zone dedicated to industrial goods. This move allowed the UK to continue importing agricultural products from the Commonwealth at low tariffs. EFTA was further designed to prioritise government cooperation over stringent rules, which appealed to the United Kingdom's political preferences. However, this structure initially jeopardized EFTA's formation, as other nations involved in the talks saw the UK as prioritizing its interests over their own. With agricultural exports playing an essential role in almost every other country's economy during the EFTA talks, the absence of these goods in the proposed free trade deal resulted in the UK being viewed as self-serving. The EEC, which had just been formed, saw the EFTA as a threat to their newfound political unity, leading France to veto the deal. Undeterred, the UK pursued negotiations with the Scandinavian countries, Austria, Switzerland, and Portugal. In 1960, they established the EFTA through the Stockholm Convention, which revolved around the free trade of industrial goods and government cooperation. The emergence of the EFTA alongside the EEC could have led to a destructive trade war. However, the UK didn't envision the EFTA as competition, but rather as an opportunity for collaboration, a plan that would be revealed in the upcoming narrative. The Roots of British Cakeism The British have a history of wanting both the economic benefits of European integration and the freedom to maintain Commonwealth preferences, an attitude now referred to as cakeism. When faced with EEC tariffs, the UK set up the EFTA as an alternative to the EEC Customs Union, seeking a free trade agreement. Although negotiations were doomed from the start, the UK eventually applied to join the EEC in 1961, surprising Europe. There were several pragmatic reasons behind the decision, including increased trade with EEC countries, declining Commonwealth trade, and the EEC's economic boom. Despite France's veto due to concerns of diminishing influence and the UK acting as a Trojan horse for the US, Britain eventually joined the EEC in 1973 after Charles de Gaulle was forced to resign. Thatcher's Unintended EU Legacy Although the UK's entrance into the European Economic Community, EEC, in 1973 was ill-timed due to the impending global recession, Margaret Thatcher's rise to power in 1979 set the stage for economic revival. Committed to eliminating trade barriers and fostering a free market, Thatcher sent a minister to Brussels to create a European single market. 
The resulting 1985 white paper outlined three types of barriers hindering business, physical, technical, and financial. By 1993, EEC nations had lifted these barriers and formed the European Union EU. However, Thatcher's increasingly anti-European rhetoric and centralization of power in Brussels ultimately led to her resignation in 1990. The entry of the UK into the European Economic Community EEC, coincided with an unfortunate global recession in 1973, leading to economic decline and emergency loans from the International Monetary Fund IMF. Desperate for a solution, the UK elected Margaret Thatcher in 1979. She believed that by eliminating trade barriers and promoting the free market, the economy could be revitalized. Aiming to establish a European single market, Thatcher sent a minister to Brussels to address the three identified barriers to business. Physical barriers, such as customs checks, consumed valuable time and resources. Technical barriers, like differing consumer regulations, forced companies to adapt products to various standards, decreasing profits and taxes. Financial barriers arose from inconsistent value-added tax VAT, rates, necessitating costly inspections. Twelve EEC nations embraced the White Paper's recommendations and gradually dismantled these barriers. By 1993, the European single market was established, and its members formed the European Union. Thatcher's role was critical in the EU's creation, as she championed a free and competitive market. Ironically, Thatcher's own position evolved into a more anti-European sentiment. She expressed concerns about the centralized power in Brussels and exhibited strong Germanophobia in her speeches. This radical stance ultimately led to her own party's abandonment, and she resigned in 1990. Thus, while Thatcher's legacy played a key role in forming the EU, her political career ended in discord. Cameron's Fateful Brexit Promise the UK has always had a tumultuous relationship with Europe which eventually led to Brexit. In 2010, David Cameron was elected as the country's Prime Minister, representing the Conservative Party. The European Union expanded into Eastern Europe in 2004, leading to significant immigration into the UK, and this caused a backlash among some British people. As a result, the right-wing UK Independence Party, UKIP, led by Nigel Farage and opposing the EU, gained momentum. Cameron, concerned about UKIP's rising popularity, promised to renegotiate Britain's membership in the EU and hold a referendum if he was re-elected in 2015. Cameron won the 2015 election but made a crucial mistake by pledging to end the free movement of people to the UK, something that contradicts the EU's core principles. Despite managing to secure several concessions from Brussels, such as applying an emergency break on in-work benefits for EU migrants, reducing child benefits based on the living costs in the child's resident country, and not being committed to an ever closer union among member states, Cameron inevitably found himself in a precarious position. Confident in the concessions obtained, he campaigned for the UK to remain in the EU during the referendum. However, the British public's anticipation of ending free movement, fueled by UKIP's anti-immigration rhetoric, led to a 52% majority vote in favour of leaving the EU in June 2016. The following morning, David Cameron resigned as Prime Minister, setting the stage for the country's exit from the European Union. Decoding Brexit's Puzzle The British, known for their pragmatism and political stability, surprisingly voted to leave the European Union. The reasons behind this decision can be traced back to various factors, including the 2007-2008 financial crisis, globalization, and domestic austerity measures. While the UK's political landscape shifted due to these complex issues, the Leave campaign managed to amplify them in their favour, ultimately leading to Brexit. The world was caught off guard when the British people voted to leave the European Union. Their country was synonymous with political stability, so how could future generations understand what led to such a momentous decision? It's essential to consider the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Although the UK and the US started their recovery in 2010 through quantitative easing, 
the European Central Bank's slower response to the recession only allowed the Eurozone, except Germany, to bounce back in 2016. This sluggish recovery fueled anti-EU sentiments among British politicians, eventually becoming a key component in the referendum campaign. Another significant factor was globalization. With international trade growing exponentially since the 1980s, the world's economy became more interconnected than ever. Products could move around the globe in just days, boosting prosperity and lifting millions of people out of poverty. However, it also left unskilled workers in developed countries, like the UK, feeling threatened by job relocations and immigration. Research showed that regions with high unemployment and a history of manufacturing were more inclined to vote for Brexit. Lastly, the domestic landscape played a critical role. In 2010, Prime Minister David Cameron introduced an austerity program to reduce government debt, which involved cutting £14.3 billion from public services. Leave campaigners seized this opportunity to argue that the UK was giving too much money to Brussels and not adequately funding public services. All of these reasons culminated in the UK voting to leave the EU. The challenge that remained was to negotiate a suitable deal for their subsequent departure. Navigating the Brexit maze The United Kingdom's politicians have a history of attempting to broker deals that are not always completely practical, and Brexit is no exception. With a multitude of options on the table, UK's uncertain stance and conflicting preferences have stunted the negotiation process with the European Union. Each potential course of action would ultimately undermine some aspect of the UK's desired outcome, leaving the government in a challenging position as they try to navigate the complexities of Brexit. The United Kingdom is no stranger to political negotiations that verge on impracticality, but when it comes to Brexit, uncertainty has added another layer of difficulty. Negotiating with a partner as important as the European Union is challenging when the UK itself is not certain of what it wants. Initially, many believed that Britain would push for a soft Brexit, which would entail a less severe separation from the EU and a continuation of the UK's ties to certain EU institutions. In essence, this would involve the UK staying within the single market or the customs union. However, when Theresa May became Prime Minister, she unveiled a hardline plan for Brexit. This plan included leaving the single market to avoid the free movement of people and exiting the customs union in order to strike individual trade deals with other countries. This approach brought joy to Brexiteers but created significant concerns for various sectors of the British economy. For instance, the UK's financial services sector, with London at its centre, depends on identical regulations across all countries involved in the trade, something that a hard Brexit could hamper. Despite the UK's efforts to obtain special treatment for this industry, the EU insisted that Britain cannot cherry-pick the aspects of the single market it wishes to maintain. Another possibility was emulating Norway, which participates in frictionless trade with the EU through the single market. Unfortunately, this option clashed with May's desire to control the free movement of people. Opting for a free trade deal with the EU, similar to Canada's arrangement, also faced resistance from May, as it lacked privileged access to European markets. With each avenue explored, May's requirements appeared to rule out the possibility of frictionless trade with the EU. To complicate matters further, May called for a snap general election in April 2017, claiming that a conservative victory would strengthen her position in Brexit negotiations. Instead, the election results eliminated the conservative majority in Parliament, forcing May to form a government supported by the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland, a region that would play a significant role in Brexit negotiations as they unfolded. Unraveling the Irish Border Conundrum the division of Ireland in 1921 resulted in decades of violent conflict between the Catholic-majority Republic of Ireland and the Protestant-majority Northern Ireland. This conflict was significantly quelled with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, which allowed for an invisible, soft, border due to shared participation within the EU's customs union and single market. The Brexit negotiations have complicated this achievement, as they led to intricate debates on how to preserve the open border without jeopardizing EU tax and safety regulations. As a safety measure, a backstop was proposed, 
although its implementation remains an ongoing issue. The division of Ireland in 1921 created a lasting conflict between the predominantly Catholic Republic of Ireland, RO, desiring independence, and the Protestant majority regions of Northern Ireland, NI, preferring to stay within the United Kingdom. Decades of strife involving Catholic Republicans and Protestant Unionists fighting over Ireland's future finally saw a semblance of peace with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. This accord successfully ended decades of bloodshed and established an invisible or soft border between the ROI and NI, facilitated by their joint membership in the EU's customs union and single market. The invisible border eased tensions but became a contentious issue amidst the Brexit negotiations, keeping the frictionless Irish border comes with a cost. Northern Ireland's departure from the EU's customs union and single market would necessitate checks on goods crossing between South and North, ensuring their adherence to regulations. Both the ROI and NI ruled out re-establishing a hard border, leaving the decision-makers grappling with the challenge of how to maintain the delicate balance. As concerns grew over the possibility of a physical Irish border, a backstop was demanded by the ROI and the EU. This solution would entail Northern Ireland abiding by EU regulations, precluding the need for a hard border while remaining part of the customs union and single market. However, Brexiteers were vocally frustrated by what they deemed a loss of sovereignty. Ultimately, in December 2017, the UK issued a report stating that the backstop would only be implemented if a more viable solution couldn't be found. Hoping to avoid activating the backstop, the UK has sought a trade agreement with the EU that would render border checks unnecessary. While the Good Friday Agreement stands as a testament to the power of peaceful negotiations, the Brexit dilemma continues to challenge the resolution of the Irish border conundrum. The Jersey Minus Brexit Proposal In an effort to find a solution for the Irish border issue, the United Kingdom and the European Union proposed an Irish backstop, also known as the Jersey Minus Option, based on the customs arrangements of the British island of Jersey. Under this proposal, the whole UK would join the EU Customs Union, while Northern Ireland would remain in the single market for goods only. It seemed like a breakthrough moment, but intense political infighting within the UK put it to a standstill. The search for a solution to the invisible Irish border dilemma led the UK and the EU to the idea of an Irish backstop. Designed to prevent a hard border in Ireland while also respecting most of then Prime Minister Theresa May's red lines, it became a crucial point in the Brexit negotiations. With the idea of the backstop in mind, May called her ministers to Chequers, the Prime Ministerial Country House, in July 2018. They developed a new negotiating stance, resulting in what came to be known as the Jersey Minus Option. Named after its resemblance to the customs arrangements of the British island of Jersey near France, the Jersey Minus option proposed that the whole UK would stay in the EU customs union, while Northern Ireland would also remain in the single market for goods. This arrangement would allow the UK to end the free movement of EU citizens and maintain an invisible border in Ireland. However, it came with a significant compromise the UK would be unable to strike its own trade deals while in the customs union. When news of the draft withdrawal agreement came out on November 13, 2018, it seemed like a breakthrough had finally been achieved. Unfortunately, political infighting within the Conservative Party quickly put a halt to progress. Passionate Brexit supporters opposed Northern Ireland remaining in the single market, viewing it as a decrease in British power. The inability of the UK to sign its own trade deals further infuriated them. Realizing that her Chequers plan would face defeat in the December 2018 parliamentary vote, May decided to delay it. The following day, a vote of no confidence was called against her, which she won by a narrow margin. The result left her political legitimacy in question. As 2019 dawned, the UK found itself at a critical crossroads. The Jersey Minus option seemed like a viable solution, but opposition and indecision continue to plague the British government. The story of Brexit is still being written, and its ultimate outcome remains uncertain. In conclusion, a short history of Brexit, 
offers a comprehensive analysis of the UK's complex relationship with European integration, from its beginnings in the European coal and steel community to the current Brexit negotiations. Key takeaways highlight the UK's historical ambivalence towards supranational institutions, its efforts to balance its commitments to the Commonwealth and European trade, and the political factors that have shaped its approach to Brexit. By understanding the historical context leading to the Brexit vote and the internal political dynamics at play, readers gain valuable insights into the ongoing challenges of the negotiation process and the uncertain future of the UK-EU relationship.